Trivia is the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron this week, Leonigo99. Thank you, Leongo. Today's bad idea is going to be presented by Tony. So, Tony, what do you got for us this week? We're going to be talking about the Hitler Diaries. Now, I know what this is because we have a bad failed recording that we did previously. Thanks yeah, we to... had some technical issues. So, like, Al went from being, like, completely unknowing of this topic to being on top I of will it. not try to recreate my naivete, but I would like for you to explain what is what is a Hitler diary. These are not real diaries that the real Hitler kept. Because that would not... It's a bad idea to be Hitler, but, like, keeping diaries, not a bad idea. Yeah, not generally. Especially whenever you are his, a historical figure. But the Hitler diaries were a hoax that was so juicy the press couldn't resist. Not only did you have piles and piles of books supposedly authored by Hitler himself, you had a captivating story of their recovery. The content of the diaries had implications to what Hitler actually knew of the Holocaust and also showed the banality of his day-to-day life. Everybody loves some banality and Hitler mixed together. When you think about Hitler, you're like, I want to find out what boring stuff that guy was up to. <laughs> like, I know about that book and, like, him killing a bunch of Jews and just sort of, like, starting off the whole Nazi thing, but... Like, yeah, and, how... like, starting a war that killed 55 million people. You know, little things like that. But, like, how was his relationship with Goebbels? Did he have good poops? <laughs> like, these are the real questions that I ask. And actually, it all of those types of things are answered. Like, including the poops question. Oh no, this is not something that I knew from the last recording. We have to hear about Hitler poops, Tony, even if they are fake. I'm ex- I was mocking this, but I need to know about Hitler's poops. It was actually more about flatulence and things oh. like that than, like, actual consistency of his stool, but you know. Anyway, there was only one problem with these diaries, and that was that these 60 black journals were a complete forgery done by a man named Conrad Kujau. Kujau was an illustrator and an escapee from East Germany who often dealt in Nazi memorabilia, some of which was authentic and many more he made with his own hands. You know, if you are going to have only one problem with an object, the fact that the object is completely different from what you assume that it would be, in reality, is is a pretty big one to, to have. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a big one, especially whenever like the only reason these have value is because of their supposed authenticity. Yeah, nobody's buying, like, I needed some spare notebooks and some Hitler guide written all in them. Kuja found that buying cheap knockoffs in East Germany of Nazi memorabilia would sell very well in West Germany and other parts of Europe. Usually he could sell these items for about ten times the price that he picked them up for in East Germany. Whenever he noticed this, he also started to up his game a little bit. He found that he could forge documents of authenticity and kind of give credence to like different war heroes and things from the German army. And one of the first things he did was he found an authentic German helmet from World War I and forged a document saying that it was worn by Hitler in Ypres in 1914. So this is an like, important battle Hitler actually was involved with. For those of you who don't know, he fought in World War I. Part of the reason he got so angry and bitter is because he sort of looked at life and said, why did I survive? There's no meaning to any of this. Germany forever. I guess we'll have to find meaning in the the country rather than the individual. And this is like going back to those her, Hitler, the early day, years and saying this helmet belonged to him. Now, it is an actual real helmet from the area, right? Yeah, it's a it's an actual World War One helmet. It was something basically like from a surplus place where like they were selling the old equipment. So it wasn't like he forged a helmet. He just bought a German helmet and forged the documents for it. Maybe a more impressive feat, honestly, if he's out back with his anvil, like, banging out World War I helmets. Yeah, I imagine getting that to actually look right would be a bit tough. But he also began working on changing his handwriting to match the script that was popular in Germany in the 1930s and learned to alter it to make forgeries based on the handwriting of Martin Bormann, Rudolf Hess, Heinrich Himmler, Hermann Goring, and Joseph Goebbels. So he's, he was very good at this sort of scripting, and that goes back to him being an illustrator. He was just very good at adapting his style. And it is kind of interesting seeing this script, because in almost every like Nazi document, you notice this very slanted, kind of hard cursive script that most of them wrote with. Like, it was, like they called it some sort of like gothic script. 
Okay. So this was something that they developed intentionally as sort of like, here's another way that Germans are superior, or was it just like, this is how they got taught in school, and so everybody was using I, it? I, I think it's more just how they got taught in school, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were more implications behind it. I did not do the research into that as much, just that there were a lot of similarities in their script. That's fine. Okay. While he watched his business grow, Conrad grew bolder in his forgeries. He began to make paintings and sell them, claiming them to be Hitler originals, even though the content wasn't anything Hitler ever tried to paint. He even made forgeries that were supposed to be the early drafts of Mein Kampf, where he would take a typed page from the book, add intentional mistakes, and scrawl in the lines and the margins like Hitler had actually been doing the editing himself. <laughs> I like that one. I also think it's really... You hear that Hitler was a painter at some point in his life, and that natural question does occur of like, well, where is it at? Where are the paintings? I, they might, Some of them might still exist, right? But you Yeah, do, some of them still exist. You kind of want to see, like, well, what was he drawing? It was mostly, like, buildings, landscapes, things of that nature. And while they were very accurate to what they were doing, there wasn't any sort of style or substance that made them special. That's why <laughs> you, you would think that, like, Hitler, right? You know, he's going to go on to be, pr you know, sort of this iconic figure and, like, in a bad way. Um, I, I realized that when I said that it sounded like, man, that well, icon You could be a Hitler. bad icon, too. Yeah. But you could be an icon for evil. You you would think that this guy would be sort of like drawing, I don't know, like muscular like Aryan dudes or maybe sort of <laughs> some striking like German landscape like the motherland and here's how and now it's just like he's just got some pastoral landscapes. Here's a building that I was standing in front of. I drew a sketch of it. Like, and the thing was, Kujau actually did some of that. He did a lot of like, uh, like very Aryan men and things like that, and nudes that uh, that Hitler never tried to do. Like, it was just it wasn't even the same content at all. A lot of times, you know, you wonder if Hitler like would have put his horrible, horrible, horrible philosophy into art if maybe he would have been like not just not like vilified but maybe in some way celebrated it's it's hard to say like i have no idea on that subject i i will say this is a, a complete tangent but there is a documentary on netflix about a guy who was an extreme polish nationalist uh who was also an artist. I but you look at his art and like you can look into it and find the sort of philosophy that he has about racial superiority and stuff, but you can also look at it and think, man, this guy is a good sculptor. Like you just <laughs> you like the talent is insane. It's just that the brain that created it was bent the wrong way. And whenever you get that sort of talent, you can see that people might actually be inspired by that sort of art, and it's very unfortunate. But it was at this point that Ku Zhao started making his first Hitler diary. He started doing these scripts, he uh, monogrammed the front of these black books, put a special stamp on it that was the same as what the SS used whenever they were doing documents, and made this forgery look as clean as possible for for what they were doing, and a lot of it was following history books, just basically like, all right, so on this time he was in this area, he and he met with these like this particular general, and a lot of the entries were kept very, very simple. It was almost like an appointment book with occasional sides, I where he was questioning things he was doing or talking about generals or saying that uh, Goring was wearing a sloppy suit today, and just a lot of small things like that. So he, it was general enough that it was believable, but not deep enough to really give insight. Well, and you would expect that anybody really writing a journal wouldn't have like some earth shattering insight every day. I think I yeah. have heard of similar forgeries that failed because people are like, there's just no way that like all of this was a real thought of this person, you know, that they would have gone this deep or had something this dramatic happen all the time. By keeping it boring, right, you're also keeping it more real because that's how real life is. Like, well, went to the store today, bought bread, was stale. One of the things about that is like a lot of people get caught by cops when cops notice that they're giving too many details when they're trying to sell a lie. So if you add too many details, that immediately makes it seem a little bit less believable. Like, you're just trying to compensate. This guy seems like he's doing his due diligence. How does he get caught? Well, the, the getting caught happens a lot later. 
This is whenever he actually was contacted by somebody from Stern Magazine. This person was named Gerd Heidemann. And Gerd was an obsessive collector of Nazi memorabilia, as well as a very, very gullible person. His entire apartment was covered in paintings supposedly by Hitler, even though he probably had more original Hitler paintings than Hitler ever actually painted. <laughs> That's quite the feat. <laughs> he had mountains of documents and re relics from the Third Reich, some real and many false. He even claimed to have the pistol that took Hitler's life, which is a very, very hard thing to authenticate. It was just a standard Walther pistol. And while he was doing this, he was also going bankrupt from all the collecting that he was doing, spending millions of Deutschmarks on his collection that also included Hermann Göring's yacht. So he's a wealthy man, but he's losing all of his money because he basically just has this obsession. Jeez, so this guy, he's not even, like, putting it in a museum or whatever. He just has his house that he just keeps buying whatever, you know, you can slap Hitler on it. And he's like, I'm about it. Go, go, go. Yeah. It's like when Walt Disney licenses, a you know, Mickey Mouse ears to somebody selling juice boxes, you know, <laughs> think... But, but with Hitler. His house actually looks like a university archive. Like, it, there were parts of a documentary I was watching where he's wandering through. Everything's, like, perfectly in binders and everything. And he just walks up, pulls this out, and he's like, this is remnants from a plane that was shot down. And just all sorts of different stuff in this archive. Also, his bedroom is, like, completely covered in Nazi memorabilia. Whenever his wife was asked, like, how do you sleep with this much Nazi memorabilia around? Like, that's Hitler. That's all of this bad stuff. Uh, she said... How do you sleep without it? So she was all in, too. When you say all in, I do have the question, like, there's a difference between somebody who has a morbid fascination with Hitler, right? Like, you know, he's an important historical figure, despite all of his evil, because of all of his evil, really. So it, yeah, I don't necessarily think that somebody who was like, oh, wow, this, like, this is something that Hitler had is a fan. But this guy strikes me as kind of a fan, Tony. Is that is that an inaccurate statement that's the impression i got like i never heard him in any of these descriptions say anything overtly racist anything that was like super pro hitler but it was mostly because they're talking about his embarrassment over this topic so i don't really think they swayed into that he definitely seemed like a fan okay it's different whenever you have like a helmet on display in your house that's like well this is a defeated enemies thing like if you if you have a bayonet from a a rifle from the Civil War that's from the opposite side, that doesn't mean that you're a Confederate. That just means you have a piece of history. Whenever your entire house is decked out with Confederate things, people might have some questions. Well, I'm from Florida, Tony, so if I had a bayonet from the opposite side, it would be the Union. Unless I was at uh, the fort here that stayed in Union control somehow. That seems like it would be kind of an island in the middle of everything going I on. I was just oh. wondering about that today, but it has nothing to do with this topic, so I will not explore it further. <laughs> When Gerd heard about these diaries, he knew it could be huge for Stern Magazine to get exclusive rights to them. He told the management there that he had access to all of these journals, and they essentially gave him a blank check to acquire the diaries. The story from Kujau is what sold it. It was during Operation Seraglio. All of Hitler's personal documents were loaded onto a plane that took an emergency flight to evade Russians that they closed in on Berlin. And this is an actual mission that happened. These documents and things that uh, were on there... There were a lot of authentic things from the top brass in the Nazi government at the time. That's why they were so particularly into this plane. And Hitler actually sent one of his most trusted people with this plane. Whenever it went down in East Germany, like Eastern Germany, it wasn't East Germany at the time yet. Right, right. Some of the crates survived the crash and were collected by the locals. Later, the SS would come and secure the scene, but they weren't able to recover all of the different crates that were there. So there was a lot of legitimacy to this story, and that that definitely worked in Kujau's favor. This guy's really good at this sort of what is the word that uh, Stephen Colbert it's just coined? Detail work. Truthiness. Truthiness. I can see that. Where he's like he's very immersed in the real story of how things would have turned out. He knows his history pretty well, or at least is studying the history pretty well. And he understands what these kind of documents would look like. Yeah, and pair this with something that they found inside the Fuhrer bunker. One of the few pictures that came from that, like before it was uh, taken over by the Russians, is in Hitler's sleeping quarters. You can see a pile, like two piles of black books that look exactly like these journals just on a shelf. 
So whenever you have this story and you have this picture, you have the perfect recipe for a hoax of this size. Yeah, I could definitely, I, I am, I know that this isn't true. And yet like the way all these pieces fit together, I'm like, that's such a good story. I want to yeah. buy it. Well, you would have to pony up a lot of money because Gerd would end up buying the diaries for about 9.3 million Deutschmarks, which at the time, keep in mind, this is 1980s money, was 3.7 million U.S. dollars. And he's buying these for a newspaper, right? These are actually not for his private collection, at least no, directly. No, this, uh, this is more for uh, Stern Magazine, which uh, is like Sun Magazine. It's like some of the tabloids and some of the other things. A little bit more news than like tabloid kind of has a bad association. It's like back in the day, it wasn't all just like celebrity gossip and things like that. Yeah, well, you know, in my day, it was B- you know Bat Boy, Tony. So <laughs> they they I did make those. him up, but they didn't pay a million dollars plus to make him up. He might have earned over a million dollars. Those are some of the most iconic of the Weekly World News. Yep, I miss <laughs> the Weekly World News, Tony. I never bought a copy, but man, I miss walking down the supermarket aisle and seeing like. Jesus's face in plume of smoke over White House says, yeah. <laughs> go would, buy Taco great, Bell. They had some great old style Photoshop before Photoshop was a thing. I always loved that stuff. Oh, it was so good. I, even as a youngster, <laughs> I was like, this is not real. But man, yeah. was it cool. But Men in Black told us it was real. The 9.3 million Deutschmarks was actually a little bit high as Heinemann would skim a few million off the top. I don't know if he was justifying this as like a finder's fee, but he just kind of decided to do it. So this At guy this point, the- is going to this newspaper, getting their money to buy Hitler memorabilia that's probably priced out of his price range, taking some of that money, and then probably also going to have the benefit of at least getting his hands on these objects that he basically got paid for. Yes, like uh, it's it's multiple thi- like things going on here. He's trying to make some money. He's trying to get these documents, and he's trying to get his magazine behind it so that he has full access to what might be one of the most important pieces of memorabilia from the entire Nazi era. Okay. And it was at this point that the verification process began. Hugh Trevor Roper, an Oxford professor and historian, was one of the first to provide real verification for news agencies. He said that he was 100% sure that these documents were real. Then he dropped it to 99% the day before publication. Either way, it was enough that news agencies took notice. 99% is still pretty high. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. I I would invest some money on a 99% chance. Yeah. And the thing is, the handwriting was very close. Like, this was Kujau's biggest thing, is that he had a great way of making his script look a lot like Hitler's. The signatures weren't quite right, but the actual script for the, like, the day-to-day writing was very good. And also, the verifications were happening via photocopy, so it wasn't exactly like having the journals right in front of the people. They were just kind of going off of, like, the analysis there. It just seemed like you would kind of want the actual thing in front of you before you're going to announce the, the real authenticity. Right, because it's not always the quality of the work that gives it away, right? Like, a lot of forgers are excellent at making things look exactly like an original, close enough that you're like, well, this is still a great work of art. (laughs) You put so much money into it and time, or maybe not money, but definitely a lot of time to be able to make it as good. And then the real tell is what are the materials where and i mean a great forger will yeah, hopefully what paints try. what everything else right Do, does the paint have uh certain levels of radiation in it because anything that was made after they dropped the first atomic bomb has low levels of uh certain isotopes in it that didn't exist in the world before then so physical interaction with a forgery is actually pretty important to figuring out if it's real or not To get the rights from Stern to publish the diaries, Rupert Murdoch was willing to put up hard cash. We've talked about Rupert Murdoch before. He's the guy that owns Fox News. He also owns tons of newspapers all around the world. When a bidding war started at nearly $3.5 million, Murdoch went to the other people doing the bids, this case it was actually Newsweek magazine, and said, hey, why don't we both cover this? We'll drop our bids. And they were able to get that down to $500,000 for the rights to it. There's that so, win-win good attitude. Good business there. Yep, win-win for both sides. We're reading about that in the Seven Habits of Successful, Effective 
something kind of people. It's a good book. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like the, it was definitely a win-win for them. And also Stern was a little bit disappointed because they just paid all this money to get the rights, but they didn't have other people bidding. So they just decided they were going to sell the serialization rights there. They were still holding on to, to the books from which they were keeping in a vault. One of the many newspapers that Murdoch owned in the UK was the Sunday Times. They were known for their investigative journalism occupant, and they decided that they were going to be the ones that actually got to report on these diaries. The Sunday Times reporters were reveling in the success of making one of the best headlines in a single issue that they ever did. They took a deep dive into this, and they called it The Secrets of Hitler's War. They sold many, many thousands of extra copies that weekend alone. Man, you would have done so much better with Hitler's poops revealed. <laughs> Secrets of Hitler's sex life. Unfortunately, the day that this was put out, the editors received a phone call from Hugh Trevor Roper that he rescinded his belief in the diary's authenticity. So he went from 100% to 99% to full-on pulling his name off of it. What what did he see? Like, what what is his tell? Is it just one of those things where he thinks about it more and more and he's like, no, actually... That seemed to be the effect that was happening there. And I don't know if he was reading further into it because you've got 60 journals. That's a lot to read through and a lot of things that you'd have to go to history books to verify. It seemed like some of it was just a uh, slight uh, things that weren't lining up with books that he had read, as well as just a feeling that, that it wasn't real. But once again, he was going off of photocopies of these things. So he didn't get to have that in front of him and feel it. But even this guy is like getting that sort of inner voice telling him like, I don't know, man. It, I, mm, it, something wrong here. Yeah, that instinct was uh, was bugging him a lot, and he just decided that he was going to go with it and try to save face by uh, renouncing them. But it was already too late because they had uh, they had published this. And the day after the publication, D. Stern held a D. Stern is the magazine held a press conference at its offices in Berlin. They talked about the great lengths they went through to verify the diaries, how the graphology was done, and how this was the scoop of the century. As they brought the diaries out and paraded them for the press, a man in the back stood up holding a photocopy of the diaries and yelled out, These diaries are absolute tosh. <laughs> ah. one, one of the most British things that I've ever heard. That is delightful. He's this is yes. like the guy who comes to the wedding just so he can yell, I object. <laughs> but better <laughs> because there's weddings all the time and there's only, well, there aren't any Hitler diaries, at least that we know of, but... There was just these one set of fake ones, and this guy's like, oh man, I'm about to dunk on these dudes so hard. And it's an interesting story behind the man who did this. His name was David Irving, and he was sort of an expert in this. He'd written several books on the Third Reich and was well known for his ability to sleuth out authentic documents from that era. He actually believed that these were fake because he had had dealings with Kujau before and found that the documents that Kujau sold him were fake. And so going through these, seeing this script, seeing all of these things, he pretty much decided that they were going to be, that they had to be forged. And it's really weird what happened with him later as well, because this is a guy that publicly renounced it and loud enough that he got kicked out of a press conference. But then after more of the diaries were revealed and it kind of showed some of his own biases about Hitler not being as bad and the Holocaust being overblown and things like that, which was actually in the diaries. They kind of made that a, like a smaller thing than what Hitler would have known about like the Holocaust. He decided that he was going to support the diaries and then later would denounce them again. But like he basically just made a big ruckus at this and started people on the path of questioning the validity of the documents. Man, that's so much, like, whiplash when you, you're, like, thinking about this guy. And, you know, on the first, on the one hand, you're like, all right, yeah. And then you find out, like, he reads, well, Hitler actually wasn't that bad. And he's like, wait a minute, no, they're real. Why are you guys, yeah. why are you guys trying to cover up all this good information about Hitler? A few days after this incident, the German Federal Archive determined that the diaries were absolutely fake. They finally had their hands on these diaries, and they sent it to a materials testing facilities and determined that they had been bound in nylon, which is not how books from the 40s were bound, as well as inconsistencies from the period they claimed to be from, other than the nylon. It's like the paper was made in the 1970s. Like, there's so many different inconsistencies here for what you would need from a diary, and whatever experts finally had them, it was obvious that they were fakes. 
But because Stern bought in wholeheartedly because of Gerd Heinemann, they decided that they were just going to go with the fact that they were real. Yeah, that's, uh, it's hard to admit that you're wrong. Unless, yep. unless the, the wrong that you were wrong about that actually proved that you were right in the case of the one guy who found the information about Hitler that he wanted after he had already denounced the books. And the thing is, like, having these books could have changed the national conversation on Nazism and so on, especially because there would have been enough people that were like, well, he didn't talk about the, the Holocaust in his diaries. What does that tell you? Like, that, that means that this whole thing is a big conspiracy. And the only reason they're calling them fake is because it's it's not conforming to the historical narrative. Like, there was a lot in these books that could have changed our view on the Third Reich. And it's it's interesting, like, how if it had been a better fake, we probably would be having some questions about uh, the validity of, like, the historical timeline that was shown. Or at least there would be people that have that. Yeah, it's even a little bit surprising because, as we mentioned, as you mentioned earlier in the story... This guy was known to buy relics of the era and then doll them up to be what he wanted them to be. I don't know for a fact, but it seems like you could have, in 1970, found some notebooks that were put out at the right time period. But he just didn't put that effort in. He 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 put all the effort in to hand write all this stuff out, but he didn't think... Maybe I'll actually go get the real materials that might have been used at the time. Well, prior to this, he was mostly dealing with private collectors that would pay him like four or five thousand dollars for like a random document signed by Himmler or something like that. So it was people that weren't putting it up to scientific scrutiny. And I think he just accidentally found this golden egg where he could make millions off of there. Uh, the initial negotiations were only for a few thousand per uh, per diary. And then it just jumped up from there whenever they thought that they were fully authentic. So I think that he kind of accidentally fell into this and didn't realize that he needed to go back and get this different paper and get all these other things. Like, he just saw dollar signs. He wasn't caring about, like, the uh, the long-term implications of it. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, and to be fair, you think about this guy's, like, initial plan. If he's going to write all these diaries out, again, by hand... With the script that's not his handwriting. It's like y the amount of time that that would take you to do and then be paid just a couple thousand uh, whatever, you know, I, I don't know if it's dollars at the time, but still like it not a massive marks. payout. That's uh, that's not even that lucrative. He, he just happens to luck into it. And uh, part of the reason why people thought it was authentic is like whenever you see forgeries, you don't usually see a lot like, you don't see a giant cache of them unless it's authentic. And whenever you've got 60 diaries, that's a lot. That's way more than what people are, like, generally going to see from somebody doing forgeries. So that lended to the authenticity of it. After all of this, the Sunday Times reporters met with Rupert Murdoch asking for ways to fix their shredded reputation. He just looked at the reporters with a bored expression and asked why they were winching over small details when they had sold so many extra copies and got a bunch of new subscriptions. He basically had no problem with the fact that they had reported on something that was entirely fake because they profited either way. Well, that doesn't sound like the good man we know Rupert Murdoch to be today, Tony. <laughs> it's, it's, no. And as the media's want to do, they promoted the scoop of the century to great applause and then sold mountains of newspapers. Then, the next week when they found out that it was hoax, they sold thousands of newspapers promoting how big the hoax was. <laughs> this is actually something... Uh, that's going to come up in the next week's episode as well. But it is amazing how the newspapers and the sort of news industry can create a story. And this is still happening today. And then, like, so they, they ride the story that they've created as far as it'll go. And then once it's proven wrong, they just get on the, the other horse of, man, people believe this fake thing for so long. And ride that one just on into the sunset. One of the inconsistencies I also wanted to talk about, which is probably the funniest to me, is that Kujau actually made a mistake with the monogram on the front because he couldn't tell the difference between, like, the gothic style F and the gothic style A. So on the front of all of these journals is actually FH instead of, instead of AH. So not only is it, like, just a full-on fake, it's a fake that they should have known something was up right away. 
It's like, unless they were going for Fuhrer, uh, Fuhrer Hitler, like, there's no reason for it to be an F- FH. Yeah, I've looked up pictures of these journals, and it is, it's weird how off it looks. Um, I don't know how this guy makes this mistake. It kind of, like, you can kind of make it look like an A, but only if you hadn't seen the A in the script. Yeah, it's like you've got a monogram kit. You probably have all the letters. It's like he was either in a rush or I don't know what happened. Well, his just, hands were tired from thing. writing 66 diaries. Yeah. He's <laughs> like, oh, whatever, just slap some letters on there, we're done. I gotta feed my kids. It was at this point that the German police began to get involved. Conrad Kujau's name was released to the public. Shortly after, he would confess to the forgeries and would be arrested. Kujau said that Gerd Heinemann knew all along that the diaries were fake which may or may not be true. He might just be selling him out. Because Gerd was such an obsessive collector and was so gullible, I think that he probably thought they were real. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been wanting them so bad. Yeah, Gerd doesn't seem like the kind of guy who's thinking anything with Hitler's name on it is fake. If You, you can't fill your house up with Hitler paintings by being like, but is it really Hitler? And like he just didn't have a skeptical enough eye and it cost a lot of people a lot of money. But he would end up getting into trouble for this. It was one of those things where the fraud was big enough that the German courts were able to prosecute both of these men. And both of them received four and a half year prison sentences, which they served in full. The public perception was that this was entirely too light. But the reason why the judge relented a little bit is that they felt that Stern Magazine should have done more due diligence and they were culpable as much as Kojau or Heinemann. That's just wild. Yeah, like, they should How have, dare you let they, these people lie to you? Yeah, it's like, they, they definitely should have, but they should have done that before they even put the money up. It's like, get one of the journals, pay for that, go have an expert look at it. But now they decided that the magazine sh- was lied to and that they were culpable, all that other stuff. I'm not really sure that it matters all that much. Four and a half years isn't a small amount of time, but... I could see them, especially still having a lot of people that were alive for the Third Reich, wanting a little bit more justice and tired of having this like rubbed in their faces over and over and over again. Even with justice supposedly done, more than five million of the Deutschmarks were never recovered between the two men. It's not known if they spent it all, if they ended up putting it in other caches of money. Like it's, It's just one of those things where they did end up getting away with a fair amount of money. I would say that that's probably about $1 million US dollars each in 1980s dollars. It's probably hidden next to that treasure chest they're always digging for on the History Channel on that one island. So what do you think the bad idea here is, Albert? You mean besides lying? Because yeah, lying well, is always a bad idea. Lying is definitely a bad idea, especially in this sort of situation. It's like, unless you're a spy, don't do it. It's also a bad idea to just take people at their word for documents that could literally change history. It's like, you should probably get some people involved with that. There's so many different little bad ideas here that ended up costing millions of dollars, creating controversy, landing people in jail. There's just a mess. Yeah, that's the real bad bad idea, I think. I, I I know I just sort of mocked this judge for this, but don't spend several million dollars unless you're super sure the thing that you're spending them on is not... (laughs) <laughs> you know, fake. Yeah, it's like trust but verify. Right. Like, just get these to the materials testing lab. Have them... Like, this is not an unreasonable thing. If you buy a car, you have you take it to the mechanic, you look under the hood, you check the oil. You don't just be like, well, I guess everything's good, and, like, drive off the lot. And that's a yep. couple thousand dollars... Well, more than a couple thousand, but, you know, like, that's not millions of dollars that you've spent. Yeah, it's not the reputation of your entire newspaper. It's not... It's like uh, the the Roper guy that did that basically was shamed the rest of his career. Like he was not able to be the historian he was before that. He was a storied historian and then he lost his reputation on it because he didn't verify. It's like these people just did it based off of photocopies and that's a terrible idea. Yeah, I don't I don't blame Roper for looking at what he had to look at and sort of giving them, well, based on this, 
I, I would say that the people who were asking for verification needed to go more thorough than just faxing over some pictures. I think that's going to do it for bad ideas this week. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this, share it with your friends or look at becoming a patron at patreon.com slash human echoes. If you want to leave comments, you can check us out at human echoes on Twitter, on Instagram, on pretty much everywhere, or you can go to youtube.com slash bad ideas. Thank you guys. We'll see you next week. Bye everybody.